Wind Erosion and Deposition Wind erosion is not a very strong force. Wind can't move particles larger than sand. And silt and clay will only erode if they're dry. So in a desert where they could be dry, wind erosion has an effect. And it could have a large effect. A large dust storm could move as much as 10 million tons of dust. This is a picture of the 1935 Dust Bowl in Texas. The Dust Bowl was a result of poor farming practices of leaving the semi-arid land without vegetation. There was a drought and as a result the soil dried up and farmers watched their topsoil literally blow away. It was so bad that they could go to bed at night, wake up in the morning and see an outline of themselves on their bed because so much dust had settled during the night. This is a small dust storm over Owens Lake. Owens Lake used to be a lake back when the Owens River went to it. But since then, the Owens River has been diverted to the LA Aqueduct and now comes to Los Angeles. As a result, Owens Lake dried up. Once dry, the silt and clay and salts were free to be blown about by the wind. It's one of the largest sources of particulates in the West. The people who still live in the Owens Valley area suffered health problems as a result they finally were successful in suing Los Angeles. Now Los Angeles is trying very hard to keep the dust down. It turns out the only way they are succeeding is by keeping the bed of the Owens Lake reasonably moist. Deflation. Deflation is removal of sand and silt which makes the surface of the land go down. While that would continue endlessly until either the water table is reached, holding the soil in place, or you have something called a desert pavement a layer of residual pebbles that can't be blown away. A blowout or def deflation basin can be as deep as 50 feet. In this diagram you can see wind blowing the sand away from the few sparse plants. These are arrowweed plants. As the wind is blown away you have a lowered land surface and the plants are left on top of their own roots. This is what happened at Devil's Cornfield. The original surface of the land you can see was up there, but it has since deflated. Why cornfield? Somebody saw these strange plants and thought it resembled corn stalks. After a harvest, farmers would pile them up in piles that look like that. Desert pavement. Now most of the desert is not covered with sand dunes. It's covered with desert pavement. As you can see in this picture, desert pavement is simply a layer of pebbles that are too large to get blown away. But if you were to pick up one of those pebbles, you would find sand underneath it. The formation of a desert pavement is still somewhat controversial. There are two theories. Theory one states that wind simply blows away the sand and silt, leaving the pebbles behind, until finally there's an interlocking layer of pebbles preventing any more movement of sand. The second theory says that as wet pavement swells, the pebbles will rise and as it shrinks and dries the sand falls between the cracks leaving the pebbles above the sand. It's possible that both theories describe what happens. Movement of sand. Sand can't be moved more than a meter off the ground. So basically it moves by a skipping movement called saltation, jumping. It hops along and as it hops a few inches it lands dislodging another grain which moves a few more inches as well. Silt and clay, however, can be suspended as dust and that can go high into the atmosphere. If the sand hits a rock with enough force, the rock is then sandblasted and the sand has eroded the rock into a ventifact, these flat sides as the result of the sand erosion. Mushroom rock in Death Valley is a famous example of a ventifact. You'll notice that only the bottom of it got worn away because the sand never got more than a meter high. Sand dunes are sand deposits. One thinks of sand dunes as making up deserts, but really they only make up less than 10% of a desert. Most sand is made of quartz, because quartz is the, one of the most resistant minerals. Might have a few bits of feldspar in it, but that's not always the case. You could have sand made out of gypsum, as in White Sands National Monument, or even obsidian or calcite. Here we have the sand dunes of Death Valley, sand made of quartz. But at White Sands, that's not snow, that is gypsum. 
As the sand dune forms, the sand hops up the windward side and then builds up in a pile at the top of the sand dune. Finally, the pile gets too steep, so it has to collapse as a small avalanche down the leeward side. The sand is not able to support itself beyond a certain angle and therefore is going to fall. That angle is called the angle of repose. For sand dunes, the angle of repose tends to be about 33-34 degrees. Sand dunes will constantly move with sand being taken away from the windward side and falling down the leeward side. As a result, they tend to migrate downwind. If you sit on the top of a sand dune and look down the leeward slope, you can push your feet and create an avalanche that moves down in the way in which a liquid moves. This picture was taken at Kelso Dunes. Kelso is one of the very few singing dunes. If you get a lot of the sand avalanching at the same time, the sand starts to resonate, making a very eerie humming sound. Since the sand dunes create these slopes that are at an angle along the leeward side, you get horizontal layers with angled layers. As a result, you get something called cross bedding. Cross bedding is one way of knowing that sandstone must have formed at a sand dune. Some of the best examples of cross bedding can be found at Zion National Park. Luss is also a deposit of 